I'm very excited to introduce uh, this session, which is inspired by a major part of the library's collection. And in fact, um, we pulled out some documents, and I'm going to say something about them in a moment. But for those of you that want to see more of the library's collections, uh, at 1.30 today, after lunch, there's going to be an open house until 2.30. And so I invite all of you to uh, join us for a uh, treasures tour along with some of our most recent acquisitions. That's 1.30 at the library hall uh, across the street. Um, and uh, as a way to kind of introduce uh, our uh, session today, which is going to be looking at the work that scholars are doing today in Native American studies, uh, I want to talk about the collection that many scholars are using to do this work. And that's the collection that is in uh, our, our library. Um, this collection begins with Thomas Jefferson. Um, we've heard a lot about Benjamin Franklin uh, in the past couple of days. Franklin, of course, founded us in 1743. Uh, but Jefferson really built the house uh, upon Franklin's foundation. Uh, Jefferson supported many of the programs uh, that still are with us today. Uh, he organized research projects in the field and helped fund them. Uh, he published his research in the proceedings. He uh, contributed to the library, both in manuscripts and in artifacts. And he, uh, while he's uh, vice president of the United States, he attended almost every APS meeting that was held. It seemed like he wanted to spend more time in Philosophical Hall than uh, along with uh, Adams and Jeff uh, Washington, who he did not get along with. Um, uh, so Je Jefferson was, of course, an active scientist and researcher. And one of his, oh, well, actually, his greatest project was collecting Native American languages. He spent 30 years of his life uh, collecting languages. He used his offices as governor of Virginia, as secretary of state, as vice president as, and president uh, to send out word lists to officers, uh, military officers, diplomats, uh, other officials. And those uh, officials would send them back to Jefferson where he would compile them all in, in word lists. And he spent 30 years doing this. And he hoped first off to preserve languages and the other thing that he wanted to do was uh, compile all these languages and then conduct linguistic analysis. And the theory was that by studying and comparing Native American languages, he would be able to unearth parts of uh, the evolution of human society in North America before contact. Um, and he spent 30 years doing this. And the final piece of his project was Lewis and Clark. When Lewis and Clark uh, went out on their expedition, they carried with them these word lists, and they returned with them, and they gave them to Jefferson, and Jefferson believed he had finally gotten the final piece that he needed for this project, to complete this project, and he also thought he now had the best retirement project he could think of. Um, so in 1809, uh, after leaving the presidency, he uh, uh, leaves uh, D.C., heads up to Monticello, and he's ascending the James River, and he overnights in Richmond. And while he's at his uh, hotel, a group of thieves in uh, the city hear that the president's barge is down by the river. And so they go down to it and they pick up the heaviest trunk they can find. And they assume that it has the most valuable contents in it. They cart it up the river, they open it up, and what do they find? Nothing but paper. It's Jefferson's word list. And to these thieves, this is worthless material. But of course to Jefferson, this is invaluable. But the thieves dump the... Uh, dump the trunk in the James River. The next morning, Jefferson awakes to discover this. He searches the riverbanks and he finds about 12 sheets of paper that remain. Uh, he picks them up and he sends them to the American Philosophical Society, which you can see here. And uh, we've pulled, uh, for after the talk today, if you want to take a look at these, we've pulled one of these uh, pieces of paper up in the vitrine up here, along with a letter in which Jefferson describes both the, uh, his project and also uh, the work that the thieves did. Now, the society took it upon itself uh, to try and recreate Jefferson's work. And the person who really spearheaded that was Peter Stephen Duponceau, uh, and that's an image of him there. Um, he was a protege of Jefferson, and I like to point out that uh, if you compare these two um, portraits, he really is trying to evoke his, his mentor, I think, in it. <laughs> uh, and it, it, actually, if, this is a sidebar, but if you want to see what he really looked like, Google Duponceau and you'll see one of the first uh, daguerreotypes taken in uh, early America. It's the first one of anybody wearing a gla glasses, we believe, and uh, you'll see 19th century airbrushing because they do not look alike at all. It's almost <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> um, but, but Duponceau was uh, one of the leading thinkers of the 19th century. Uh, he had come over during the American Revolution, he became a lawyer, and then he became very active in the American Philosophical Society as the president, and he became a linguist himself. 
And as you can see here, he started to, to use the APS to send out these similar word lists to collect this type of language uh, and very much in the spirit of Jefferson. You can even see in these word lists that we've pulled uh, in this vitrine that really are modeled off the work that Jefferson himself uh, had done. And after DuPont So, the next great uh, collection to arrive is the, that of uh, Franz Boas, who is the founder of modern anthropology. And the APS received Boas's papers, but also the papers of the uh, ACLS and their Endangered Languages project of the early 20th century. And you can see here uh, the Boas papers in our, in our basement. And what happened was many of Boas's students and their students started to donate their papers to the library. Uh, so that we now have one of the largest collections of Native American and anthropological field work uh, in the world. We have uh, paper uh, collections that relate to over 440 different Native American communities, and you can see that on this map here, all the various communities whose material uh, what information we have about them. Uh, and what we've done today is we've created a center. It's called the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. And what we've realized is through the power of technology and digitization, uh, we can return this information to Native American communities in digital format where they can use it in a variety of ways. Uh, we work with communities whose language has been dormant, uh, but because of the audio recordings we have, because of the uh, linguistic material we have, they can help reawaken this sleeping language. Uh, cultural practices, they are able to look at anthropological field notes uh, to learn uh, and, and to study the observations that anthropologists made in the field 100 years ago. And it's extremely, uh, an extremely exciting project, and in 2014, the society decided to make this uh, initiative a permanent part of the library, uh, and the, uh, we applied for and received an NEH challenge grant. Um, it was a $2 million challenge grant. The society uh, has to raise $1.5 million. Uh, if we receive uh, that, we will receive $500,000 from the NEH, uh, and I'm happy to announce today that we have raised just over $1.4 million towards that $1.5 million challenge, uh, thanks to the generosity of APS members, our friends, and uh, supporters. So thank you all for that. And we're well on our way to meeting that match. Um, and we wanted to fo uh, feature uh, the type of work that scholars are doing in the field and are doing with our materials. And there's no better person, I think, to talk about this type of work than uh, Regna Darnell. Um, and I'd like to introduce Regna, who will then introduce our speakers and moderate the Q&A afterwards. Now, uh, I have gotten to know Regna well as librarian. Um, Regna uh, has been doing this type of work for decades. In fact, uh, she just shared with me yesterday that she first came to the APS when Whitfield Bell was librarian. Um, who was, uh, uh, this was uh, uh, decades ago. Um, 1966 is when she first came uh, to the APS library. Um, and she has been a great supporter of the society. Um, she uh, is the editor of the Franz Boas papers, which she's doing in collaboration with the library. Uh, she is going to publish a collected edition of Boas's papers, along with a digital edition, which we're doing together. Uh, she also serves on the advisory board of, of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research, along with other APS members, uh, Jerry Sabloff and Bob Miller. And in 2004, she was elected to the American Philosophical Society. And so, uh, Regna, uh, welcome, and thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you. I'm always dubious about whether it's better to have the portraits of our founders backing what I say, or a screen, however. Um, like the founding of the APS itself, as Linda Greenhouse and Gary Nash so eloquently characterized it in our opening session, CNAIR, the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research, did not spring to life fully formed at its nominal origin in 2014. It has a prehistory and an ongoing history that intersects with other APS initiatives extending back to the Jeffersonian legacy that we celebrate in this 275th year. Understanding Native Americans was only part of what Franklin, Jefferson, and Washington meant by useful knowledge, which they doubtless saw more in relation to the self-improvement implicit in philosophical meetings and to the ever-present necessity of negotiating terms of colonial expansion 
somewhere between hypocrisy and noblesse oblige. I have been asked as the longest standing member of CNAIR's founding generation to speak about what it means to the APS. I hope to persuade you, especially those of you who are not, whose interests and expertise lie far from contemporary indigenous issues, that something important has been happening here, of which the APS membership can be justly proud. I suggest that the American Philosophical Society is the only institution that could have done these things and that can sustain them as a legacy to American society and public discourse. There are at least four reasons for, these, for this uniqueness. First, autonomy. Neither Congress nor a board constrain our imaginations. We are free to dream and to take risks to realize our dreams. Continuity. CNAIR builds on a hoary legacy of engagement with Native Americans. Gravitas. The APS is the oldest and most respected of the New World's intellectual institutions, its history inseparable from that of the nation itself. Patrick has told us about the weightiness of the library's North American collections. And fourth, endowment. The APS has sufficient resources to commit to an expensive and long-term project. When the NEH Challenge Grant is fully funded, CNAIR will be part of the core budget of the American Philosophical Society. Now to the story none of us knew at the outset when disparate initiatives began, or if or how they would all come together. There have been many moving parts, not always in synchrony. Although I can speak only from my own standpoint and experience, I have had a ringside seat for a very long time. For me, CNAIR began in 1908 as a gleam in the eye of Matt Bakavoy, then incoming Native Studies editor at the University of Nebraska Press. He approached me about his vision for a documentary edition of the Franz Boas Papers, the professional correspondence. I am highly susceptible to gleams in colleagues' eyes. Nonetheless, after a decade immersed in the life and work of Edward Sapir, I was wary of the pitfalls of biography, given the complexity of any major figure and the absolute impossibility of closure. For good reason, there is no adequate biography of Boaz's entire career, especially after 1907, when he moved rapidly away from anthropology as then narrowly understood. But I thought, the gleam in my own eye building in strength, perhaps a team of scholars and indigenous users of the collections, especially descendants of Boaz's own collaborators, might pool their expertise and insight. Marty Levitt's eyes lit up with a now increasingly familiar gleam when Matt and I approached him. We began to plot to amalgamate and expand existing initiatives, one might say, APS traditions. The Phillips Fund for Native American and Indigenous Research, quote, in ethnohistory, linguistics, and the history of studies of Native American languages in the continental United States and Canada, end quote, on which I have served since 1994 as its chair since 2006, has supported multiple indigenous scholars, many of them students, in response to the CNAIR mandate of capacity building in and for Native communities. Two successive Mellon Foundation grants supported digitizing Native American materials held by the APS, including linguistic, musical, and photographic resources of the ACLS collection of indigenous manuscripts in Boaz's personal possession at the time of his death. And this is the place where the most new material is being added. The Mellon Grants underwrote the establishment of a Native American Advisory Board in 2011, on which I have served on behalf of the APS. Two indigenous lawyers co-chaired, Bob Miller, our first indigenous elected member and a tribal judge, and Denise Zuni. Other tribal representatives had proposed or had ongoing research projects with the APS. Tim Powell, CNAIR's first director, had already worked with the Eastern Band of the Cherokees 
Penobscot, and Lake Leech Lake Ojibwe. Indigenous members all agreed to serve as a more general board, reaching beyond their own collaborations with the APS. After multiple drafts and much soul searching, we formulated a set of protocols to be binding on publication and dissemination of indigenous materials. This is absolutely unique to this institution. These protocols serve as a guideline for MOUs in particular cases. They had morphed into CNAIR by 2014. CNAIR now has seven MOUs under Brian Carpenter's oversight, each reflecting unique community needs and circumstances. Researchers are responsible for demonstrating their established ties to descendant communities, and the communities are responsible for ensuring the proper treatment of culturally sensitive materials. Digital knowledge sharing returns the documents to the descendants of their producers in their places of origin, deeply embedded in local land and community. Another strand of the story follows the origins of the Franz Boas documentary edition from those gleams in the eyes of Matt on behalf of University of Nebraska Press, Marty for the APS, and myself with strong ties to both. We edited a tribal council partner of the Kukwakyak, Boaz's Kwakiutl, and went in search of funding. In 2010, I hosted a workshop at the University of Western Ontario, inviting potential collaborators to assess the feasibility of a Boaz documentary edition. We decided that among us, with more colleagues added to the editorial team, we could proceed with some confidence. The conference results appeared as volume one of the Boaz papers, Darnell, Hamilton, Hancock, and Smith, eds, 2015. Applications began for a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, SHRC, partnership grant. In 2012, Marty Levitt found a donor to support the digitizing of the Boaz professional correspondence, a project completed at the end of 2014. Early in 2013, Shirk awarded us 2.5 million Canadian under a, over a seven year period. That funding is nearing its financial end, but the work of various volume editors and APS staff collaborators will continue for many years. As the APS got down to its work, governed by an indigenous advisory council, the work increasingly merged with that of the emergent CNAIR. Our community's liaison, currently Don Nicholson, of our partner tribal council, is on site on Vancouver Island and channels community feedback, as does Angie Bain of the Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs on behalf of the interior, mostly Salish, BC communities. In the summer of 2014, CNAIR and BOAS Project team members were invited by knowledge keeper and collaborator Ryan Nicholson to visit the land, a crucial first step to building relationship with the Kwakwakiak of Kinkum, Kinkum Inlet, Vancouver Island. We returned a year later for the potlatch at which Michael Willey took the chiefly title of Old Seward, and again in 2016 when Ryan hosted a potlatch presenting his research, much of it based on Boaz Hunt ethnography, restoring to knowledge to contemporary knowledge, clan names that intersected across the 17 Kwakwakiak communities and witnessing his own title of Guimolas. At both potlatches, APS presented the chiefs with copies of unpublished materials recorded by George Hunt with Franz Boas, and the Boas Project offered new each new chief a one-year research assistantship to be selected by them, thus building community research capacity. Um, Brian Carpenter carries on the work of Tim Powell, which continues to snowball as new communities seek partnerships. The APS sponsored a conference on indigenous endangered languages, now wending its way toward publication through the library. Alyssa Mount Pleasant, Haudenosaunee, now serves as program director for the recent Mellon Native American Scholars Initiative, supporting fellows at undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral levels. We are increasingly finding mechanisms and funding to bring community people whose credentials are cultural rather than academic to the APS to bring, to bring them access to materials. 
A much needed new indigenous subject guide is now available online, thanks to Brian, who has developed a more extended search capacity. We are now in the process of merging the BOAS Project Omega-based meta-tagging system developed in response to indigenous collaborators' demand for a search engine, including place names, clan names, titles and prerogatives, and alternative spellings. We have also digitized and tagged BOAS documents from other repositories, most particularly the American Museum of Natural History. The, the APS will inherit our database as the project winds down. Finally, there has been an explosion of related BOAS scholarship, much of it published by Nebraska in the Histories of Anthropology Annual, which I edit. Um, many of the folks who are doing this work have APS grants in their past, mentioned particularly Reiner Hatum and Nicole Green. In sum, Senior has situated the American Philosophical Society at the cutting edge of Native American and indigenous research. The two papers that follow will illustrate some of the directions that this cutting edge is leading us. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the two speakers, and I'll give you both of them, and then they can jump up. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it didn't occur to me to stop. Okay, now we get to the good part. Um, our first speaker this morning is Anton Troyer. He received his BA from Princeton University, MA and PhD from the University of Minnesota. He is professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University and editor of Oshkabawas Native Journal, the only academic journal of the Ojibwe in the Ojibwe language. Apologies for my Plains Cree pronunciation. I don't seem to be able to acquire Anishinaabem one. Um, I'll spare you the list of titles of his papers that are listed, but note that he's received more than 40 prestigious awards and fellowships, including a 2008 sabbatical fellowship and a 2011 Franklin Research Grant from the American Philosophical Society for his work on the Ojibwe Grammar Project. His published works include, well, let's see, maybe, well, actually, okay, include everything you always wanted to know about Indians and were afraid to ask, Warrior Nation, the history of the Red Lake Ojibwe, which won the Caroline Bancroft History Prize, and the American Association of State and Local History Award of Merit, Ojibwe in Minnesota, Minnesota's Best Read for 2010 by the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, the Assassination of Hole in the Day, Award of Merit winner from the American Association for State and Local History, Atlas of Indian Nations, The Indian Wars, Battles, Bloodshed, and the Fight for Freedom on the American Frontier, and Awasin Yensak, Minnesota's Best Read for 1911 by the Center for the Book of the Library of Congress. That's pretty impressive stuff. Our second speaker in the session will be Isaiah Wilner who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Berlin Center for the History of Knowledge of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. His 2016 Yale dissertation in history was awarded the Theron Rockfell Field Prize for poetic, literary, or religious work in any discipline. He also received the 2017 Alan Nevins Prize of the Society for American Historians for the best written dissertation in American history history. That will lead to publication of the manuscript. His current research uncovers the impact of non-state people on the state, especially indigenous influence on modern thought. I'm sure he will tell us what he wants to say about non-textual archives in studying the global form of knowledge, global flow of knowledge, excuse me. In 2012, he received a grant from the Phillips Fund to support his work on Vancouver Island on the work, um, the collaborative work of George Hunt and Franz Boas. His latest work, Transformation Masks, Reco Recollecting the Indigenous Origins of Global Consciousness, appears in Indigenous Visions, Rediscovering the World of Franz Boas. Ned Blackhawk and Isaiah Wilner adds 2018. Thank you. 